fire and work with. <laughs> Well, I am, <laughs> but uh, tell them what you do with your corn for them. The Vice President of the United States. Certainly, a lot of work has gone into this convention, and one of our key leaders that you've not seen much of, but who has been working diligently behind the scenes and making many of the detailed preparations necessary for the visit of our guest here tonight, Lloyd Fairbanks, who I've been wanting to say to the convention for a long time, doing such a great job as administrative assistant to President his new position has carried out many details. Certainly, it is a great pleasure and a great privilege tonight to introduce our speaker. My acquaintance with this speaker has been over a period of many years. I saw him as a senator for the first time in the United States Senate as a member of the Senate Agriculture Committee. And the first time that I met him about 12 years ago, I met him late of an evening, in fact, near 9 o'clock of an evening, when he and his administrative assistant were working very hard to fight for the preservation of what was then the debate in the agricultural field on whether we should change from what was then termed a rigid support program to a flexible support program. And I know that he worked many hours and his great ability to debate the issue preserved for many years the, what was termed the rigid support program and after that was destroyed or after it was torn down the deterioration in agricultural prices has continued ever since. And so it has been a great pleasure to have known our speaker tonight over the period of many years. And even those that say that they disagree with our speaker will all admit that he is well informed and that he will stand for the issues that he think is, thinks is right. And so tonight, not only is it going to be a pleasure to introduce this speaker as a personal pleasure, but also, as I have said before, it's very seldom that we give awards to people that we believe have, have given outstanding and distinguished service to agriculture over a period of years. But not only am I going to introduce to you the speaker tonight, that has always been a great champion for the American farmer, and that has fought hard for what he believed was right, and not only that, that has very well demonstrated his willingness to work in any way that he could, whatever the conditions might be, to try to improve farmers' welfare. And so I'm going to, at this time, not only introduce the speaker, but I'm also going to present to him a plaque which will read, the National Farmers Organization, NFO, in behalf of its members, recognizes and pays tribute to Hubert H. Humphrey, 
Vice President of the United States for his outstanding contributions and diligent service over the years to agriculture and the American farmers. Presented at the annual convention of the National Farmers Organization, December 7, 1967, at Louisville, Kentucky. And so the great honor, not only of having the Vice President of the United States with us, it is a great honor to have that Vice President, Hubert A. Humphrey, with us. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to present the plaque and our, nice, our Vice President, Hubert A. Humphrey, to this delegation here tonight. Vice President of the United States. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Orrin Lee Staley. Thank you, my very good friend and one of the truly great leaders in this country in any field, whether it's agriculture or any other area of our society. I want to salute your national president. I like a lot of things about him. I just met his wife. She's pretty, too. <laughs> but I like the fact that he's a stand-up man. He's a fighter for what he believes in, and he's worked his heart out for you wonderful people out here in this audience and all over America. <laughs> May I say to George Matson and my friends from Minnesota how much I appreciate this this pin, I wish that you'd had those pins uh, made ready before that uh, Purdue game that we had. Uh, Minnesota wanted to go to the Rose Bowl, and I think our pins were too small, or there was something that went wrong anyway. <laughs> but it sure looks good. I've never seen a gopher look so happy. <laughs> and I would wear it all during this speech but I've had a hard day and I don't want to put any more weight on me my shoulders right now than I need to. So if George will forgive me, I'll set it over here with this fine plaque and spend a little time visiting with you. Oren, Mr. Staley, first may I thank you very much for the honor that you've bestowed upon me and for the privilege that's mine of being here with you and your officers and delegates from all over this great agricultural Midwest, South, all over America. Uh, this auditorium has uh, been in national fame only recently. There was a big prize fight out here. But I think there's more fight in the NFO than there were in both of those fellows that were in this stadium. <laughs> tell you, what they should have done was had the fight on the same time you came to town. They'd have had a big audience. <laughs> Orrin Lee told me, uh, he said, uh, Hubert, if you have a little time and you could drop down to Louisville, I'd like to have you meet a few of my relatives and a few of my neighbors. Why, I said, uh, I don't know if I can do that or not, but I I may be able to. He said, well, we'd like to have you drop in for a little social occasion. We'll have a few folks down there. I want to tell you this, Orrin Lee Staley sure does have a big family. <laughs> and what I hear, it's getting bigger all the time. <laughs> But you know, for a man from Washington to get an invitation to come out here is really quite a privilege. Uh, gosh, you know, sometimes you wonder if you're going to get invited to anything after you read the polls and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> I got to tell Orrin Lee my favorite, favorite story about getting invited. You know, they tell the story about this industrialist. 
and had a fine plant, and he had a good union in that plant. They did a lot of collective bargaining. And the industrialist was taken seriously ill. And he went off to the hospital. And nobody called him. Nobody sent him a letter. Nobody sent him a card. No get well cards. No flowers. The poor old fellow was up there in the hospital. As lonesome as could be and sicker than he ought to be. And then one day the executive committee of the local union had a meeting. And they discussed the condition of their boss. And after due deliberation, they passed a resolution. And they decided to send a get well card to, their, to the boss of the plant. And the message read like this. The executive committee of local 190 has met and duly considered your condition. And after considerable debate and discussion, by a vote of eight to seven, we wish you a speedy recovery. Uh, I don't know whether Orleans Daly had a vote or not, but I'll tell you, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> this is a rather historic evening. I'm sure we all know that we reflect for just a moment that December 7th stands in the history of America as a, well, as Franklin Roosevelt once said, a day of infamy but at least a great historical date. It was 26 years ago, on December the 7th, 1941, that this nation was attacked and we were plunged into World War Number Two. 26 years ago. And leading up to that historic and fateful day, were a whole series of events uh, which come flashing back through our minds now. Events of an aggressor and aggression. Events of where the democracies withdrew and backed up, refused to stand their ground. Events of where free people thought that they could get peace in their time by appeasing. And then Hitler's attack and then that fateful and dastardly attack on Pearl Harbor, December the 7th, 1941. That date reminds us the imperative need of our country being ever alert to danger within and danger without. It also reminds us of the imperative necessity of staying strong, not just militarily, even though that is vital in this world of today, but staying strong in our economy, staying strong in terms of our people, our people that are educated and healthy, and people that are devoted to what this country stands for and what it has meant throughout the many generations of its history. Yes, December the 7th is a day that should remind everyone that we either hang together, as Ben Franklin said, or we hang separately. It reminds us of the importance of collective security. It reminds us of the importance of being prepared. It reminds us of the importance of facing the threat of aggression before it gets too much, before the world is engulfed in Armageddon. Only 30 days ago tonight, your vice president was in Damak, Indonesia, far away from Louisville, Kentucky, in a strange land, but the fifth largest nation on the face of the earth. I had spent several days in Vietnam. It was my fifth trip to Asia since I became your vice president. Some of you may ask, well, why so many times? Because, my fellow Americans, over 50% of God's children of humanity lives in Asia. And it just is my view that the hope of peace or the possibility of total conflagration, a total war, may be decided 
by what happens in Asia. Therefore, we take a keen interest in it. Therefore, we feel that sometimes it is more important to be concerned about the Far East and what happens there than it is even to be concerned about our own East Coast and what happens there. Both are important. But the fate of mankind is no longer in any one person's hands. And more importantly, there isn't any way that we can isolate ourselves any longer. We're in this world, and it's a smaller one every year. And there isn't any way that you can... The American farmer will receive a fair price for his growing contribution to world peace and stability. And I want every American to know that that's a small price to pay. Hurriedly, I looked over some of your resolutions as I sat here while my friend Orrin Lee Staley was introducing me and speaking to you. And I looked down the line, and I haven't had a chance to read them all. But I know this, that what I've read on this first page looks mighty good to me. And I can say to you that when you seek only a price of a dollar and a half for corn and three dollars for soybeans and not less than two dollars a bushel with, for wheat, you're not asking for much. At the most, you're asking for equity, for a fair deal, and you're entitled to it. about how we're going to get to those limited goals. And my, those are limited, very limited. I'm not unmindful of the fact that 15 years ago, some of these prices were even higher than that. Name me any other commodity in America that has gone down. I know of none. You can't even get a nickel candy bar. So what I've told you is that food is a powerful instrument, powerful instrument for peace and for freedom in this hungry world. And it is an instrument, thankfully for a moment at least, that is almost exclusively American. No other nation can equal us in quantity or quality of our agricultural products. And our agricultural power I want generals and bankers and politicians and statesmen to know this, that it is our agricultural power that gives us the critical margin of national strength that this country possesses today. I've been at this business a long time, my friends, and what I'm saying to you tonight is not new. I believe it with all my heart and soul. I grew up in the Midwest. My mother is still there. Some of my loved ones are buried there. My grandparents were farm folks. I didn't get to be a farmer. I just became a pharmacist. But I want to tell you, I sold a lot of hog cholera serum. And I did take care of a few chickens that had the roof. Well, we know that we're, mighty, we're a little more fortunate today than we were some years back with our Food for Peace program. For a time, all we had in that food program was what was left over by the accident of production. But the Food for Freedom Act of 1966 gives us a virtually open-ended authority to assist nations that are willing to help themselves. 
But food for freedom is much more than an outlet for expanding farm production. It's much more than a way to improve the one acre to four share of our production which we're able to export. Food for freedom is good economics, that's for sure. But it is also good politics and good morals in a world that cries out for help and for assistance. It saves lives. And what better thing can you do? It reduces the toll of widespread malnutrition. And millions of little children are stunted intellectually and physically all of their lives because of a deficiency in protein in those childhood years. Protein deficiency takes a terrible toll of intellect and health. Food for Freedom promotes political stability. It promotes economic development. It builds export markets, and we need those markets. And thank goodness I noticed what you said in one of your resolutions here, Mr. Staley, of your interest in the farmers of America having a bigger and a better share of the export market. And I went to Europe this last spring to fight for that share, to make sure that we got a better world price for our wheat and our feed grains, and that we were not blocked out of the European markets. And I can report to you we made some progress, a lot more than if we hadn't have taken the trip. I was a good bargainer for you, Orrin Lee. Good collective bargaining. So you see what I'm trying to say to you is we must be prepared to use even more of our food abundance in the war on hunger because I sincerely believe that American food may well be the key to world peace. And I can tell you tonight that your president has ordered the Department of Agriculture and our Department of State to utilize this abundance to help other people with our food and in the same process to help the farmers of America in their bargaining for a fair price for their commodity. <laughs> now, I want to outline tonight a few things that we can do in the months ahead to assure our farmers a better break, better in terms of price and income, and that's right at the top of the list and in the quality of rural life and opportunity. I'm not one of these fellows that comes out and tells you you never had it so good. I know better than that. <laughs> but I'm also going to tell you some of the things that have been done and what more we need to do as I see it. I don't have to tell a farm audience anything about the importance of price security and price assurance. You know it. And the most important way to secure a fair price is to retain what we've done and improve, yes, greatly improve, our existing commodity programs. Senator Milton Young, I saw him just before I came here tonight. We're good friends. Oh, I guess we have a little political difference once in a while, but that just sort of keeps the broth boiling, you know. We're very close friends. And I believe he told you the fight that we have in our hands, even to retain what we have. And this man is a farmer, if there ever was one. And he's a good senator, too. The programs that we have now are the best that we've been able to get thus far. I think they're the best that we've had thus far, but they need to be strengthened. The record shows that farmers in this year's program are getting an additional 48 cents a bushel on wheat, those that are in the program, 12 cents on corn, which is sorely needed, and 15 cents a pound on cotton. We know, just to be a fact, government payments for many producers are making the difference this year between a little profit and losing money. But we also know something else, prices are down and production costs are up. 
which is the deadly combination for farmers. After year-by-year -year gains, which pushed net farm income up about 70% over 1960 levels, we have lost important ground in this, the lag year. And unless we can develop a weatherproof acreage allotment system, which isn't likely, we're going to have other years when overproduction weakens prices. This year's experience offers a convincing case for effective minimum price protection. Not very far. Look at the language of business and commerce. And believe me, I believe in our business system. I want you to know I believe in the profit system. I believe in it for the businessman, I believe in it for the farmer, and I believe in a fair and a good wage for a worker. I think that's the only way this country goes ahead. I don't think you can make any money out of coffers. And I don't believe in an economy that's a, like a three-legged stool with one leg is shorter than the other is a very stable economy. I watched some old farm friends of mine try to do some milking on one of those short-legged, three-legged stools, and the only one that came out on top was the cow. <laughs> well, let's look at the language of commerce. We say, for example, the hardware store charges 39 cents a pound for nails. That's the price put right on there. General Motors charges $3,000, $4,000 for a car. But the farmer, who also produces and sells things, what do they say about him? Well, he'll get, not charge, but he'll get, oh, $5, $4.50, $5.20 blend price for his milk, depending which year it is. Or he'll get $24, $25, 26 cents for his fed cattle. He gets it. He doesn't charge it. He gets what somebody is willing to give him. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I'm going to make a very conservative statement, one that is fully within the lexicon, within the language of American business. The farmer deserves the right to charge for his products like anybody else instead of getting what the buyer decides he can give him or can, that the farmer can have. That's what it's all about. <laughs> but let me be equally candid with you. The progress that we're talking about, further progress towards economic equity, Economic justice for farm people is going to depend primarily on what they are able to do for themselves. That's why you're here. Oh yes, government programs help. Believe me, they do help. Loans, purchases, Farmers Home Administration, Commodity Credit, REA, RTA, all of it helps. You and I know that. We don't want to lose a bit of it. We don't want to throw out the baby, you know, when you're tossing out the water from the, from the bowl. No, we want to keep what we have. But again, I repeat what that senator from North Dakota told you last night. Farm political power in the Congress, regrettably, has diminished. And the reason it's diminished is because of the shift of population. Therefore, my fellow Americans, if your political power in the halls of Congress diminishes, then you must increase your economic power in the marketplace. And that's what you're trying to do. here to organize for NFO. You've got better organizers than I'll ever be. But I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the ways that we in government can help on this bargaining power, because we ought to be partners. And I've been trying to help make it that way, Orrin Lee. Let me tell you that. I've been trying, as your vice president, to preach the doctrine of understanding and tolerance, to preach the doctrine of cooperation and partnership between the government and every segment of this economy. We don't need the government fighting farmers or business or business and farmers fighting the government. It's your government. We ought to be on the same team. 
And when we get together like we are tonight, we're going to be on the same team. We're going to learn from each other. At least I'm going to learn from you. I already have. I've got a big teacher right here alongside of me. <laughs> With that need for bargaining power, bargaining power in mind, we recently made a very fundamental change in the support loan policy to enable more farmers to maintain control of their grain until they choose to sell it. When crop loans expired under the old regulations, the government took over the stored grain and at some point had to sell it. And there was no way the government could get this grain off its hands without having some influence on the market. You know it and I know it. The new policy, and I had a hand in it, your president had a lot of opportunities that you and your children ought to have to take advantage of the unprecedented standard of living that America can offer today. We're talking about better schools and hospitals, and we're talking about communities that can afford public services, which will attract new businesses, new industries, and new job opportunities, and new income. We're talking about making it possible for rural youth to stay on the farm, to stay in their hometowns, and still look forward to a full and rewarding life. There isn't any need to compel a young man or a woman to leave his family, his home county, his hometown, because he can't make it and be driven off to our cities that are already overcrowded. Today, for every 175 rural youngsters who reach working age, there are fewer than 100 jobs in rural America. That's why they leave. This year, about 200,000 of these fine young men. And because it looks to us, our economy must be strong. And that's why you must be strong. Our people must be educated. Yes, not only educated, they must be united. And our country must have an indomitable spirit and an abiding faith in its destiny. You know, Abraham Lincoln put it so beautifully. What a wonderful man, and this is his state, Kentucky. Lincoln said, we shall either meanly lose or nobly save this last best hope on earth. And he was talking about America. Ladies and gentlemen, he put that proposition to us, not just for his day, but for days yet to come. Because the real truth is that the 